we're we're in a cycle now. We're in a cycle of all oh, you know everything's okay. We'll get back to normal. We'll trim the balance sheet. Whoa, whoa! The patient's gone into shock. The patient suffered from withdrawal. The debt-based monetary system needs a massive amount of fresh credit. You know, Fed, you got to come to the rescue. That rescue's coming. That that third round, third massive round of QE, it's going to happen sooner or later. Get guaranteed. Welcome, Land of Arcadia Economics, to another uh, episode of my bi-weekly podcast I do on behalf of Arcadia Economics and Chris and Yara. It's been a little bit more than two weeks, but um, I have a surprise guest to, to jump off the new year. Um, first, just to get Chris's business out of the way, I just wanted to mention that this podcast is brought to you by Silver Viper. Silver Viper is a junior microcap exploration company with its flagship asset, the La Virginie uh, project down in Sonora, Mexico. Um, the, the tickers are VIPRF for the US OTC exchange and VIPR.V for those of you who prefer to trade on the TSX. Now, I've been recommending Silver Viper for few years now I, I think it's i think it's a um potential at least five bagger and that was just with la virginia but um they announced i think it was in early november that they're acquiring canisil resources for for a little under five million dollars stock for stock and this really got me excited because Canisil has a couple of exciting assets. One that's probably not too far away from uh, a mine construction decision down in Mexico. It also has a portfolio of British Columbia assets. And in my opinion, um, what they're paying for this thing, including any potential back-end kickers that bump up the acquisition price. I think Canisil's portfolio of assets is worth multiples of this. And I think Silver Viper is fortunate to take advantage of a downtime in the sector, especially for the microcap juniors. Um, but at any rate, um, you know, I've, I've, it's reamped my view that that this stock could be at five, maybe even a 10 bagger over the next couple of years if, if the entire sector treats us right. Um, for those who um, might be looking to subscribe to my newsletter, the Mining Stock Journal, uh, the welcome email would include back issues that have my most recent analysis of Silver Viper, if you're interested. Uh, and one more thing, um, while Silver Viper is a sponsor of Arcadia Economics, I do not receive any compensation in any form or any way from any of the companies that I cover, including Silver Viper. So with that, I'm excited to introduce John Titus, who I've known for at least eight years. I think he told me 2014 might have been when we first started chatting. And um, John Titus has his YouTube channel, Best Evidence, and he produces just some phenomenal podcasts. And if you're interested in learning how corrupt the entire financial system is and has been, especially since 2008, as well as the political system, I highly recommend going to his YouTube channel and and going through his his videos, all of them. Um, they're all fantastic. Um, I, I can say with confidence that John does more, more meticulous research and better research than anyone I've encountered in, I guess I've been in the business world since 1985. So uh, without further ado, here's John Titus. Thank, thank you, Dave. I, I do a lot of research because I'm just so deathly afraid of being wrong. I just don't make that many videos. But I'm did, glad did I leave like anything them. out of the intro? Uh, not really. I also have channels on BitChute and Odyssey, but they're mirror channels. And I have sort of a spillover channel uh, on Rumble for videos that I think might land me in hot water on um, on YouTube. That That's it. Oh yeah, no question about that. They they won't on Twitter now that Musk has taken it over, but YouTube, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I would like to add, I'm doubly appreciative of of John's time today because our first go around on this recording 
uh, Einstein here forgot to hit record. So this this is our second iteration. Um, the first recording was not. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I was I wanted to bring John on the podcast because um, he was recently featured in, on Greg Hunter's U.S. A watchdog and if you haven't seen that podcast yet it's another one i highly recommend listening to um and there was a couple a couple topics that they discussed that i wanted to drill down into a little more deeply and it, you know i think i think these topics directly feed into and will affect um what's going to happen going forward in the precious metals sector and specifically with the prices of gold and silver and thereby the prices of the mining stocks. So, um, John, one thing I wanted to discuss was, was to kind of dive into um, the difference between um, what we call money printing and really what the Federal Reserve is doing, I mean, really what they're doing is they create reserves that then can be translated or transmitted through the banking system into what I'll call electronic spending credits. And that would just that would represent the money or currency or whatever your debit card that you use when you when you go and spend it. So um, I, I, I think some people have this impression that the Fed is sitting there with a printing press and printing currency and throwing it into the economic system. And that's not how it works. So I'd love it if you kind of dive into um, exactly what's going on and how it works and, and how it creates inflation. Yeah, that's a that's a good lead off. Um, so I'll get into it this way. In the U.S., there are three issuers of money. Uh, one is the Treasury, which mints coins. Uh, the second is the Federal Reserve, which issues, even though it doesn't really print, Federal Reserve notes, meaning cash, and it also issues reserves, as you mentioned. Um, and then the third money issuer is really banks, which create what we think of as money out of thin air when they lend. So let's just go through those quickly. We can ignore the Treasury because we're not here to talk about coins, so we can throw that out. Um, and let's not talk about cash because... When we're talking about money printing, that's not really what is that, that's not really the connotation when people use the for, the term money printing, even though most certainly the Fed does issue Federal Reserve notes. So let's just take that off the table right now. No cash, no coins. And interestingly enough, when once you take out cash and coins, legally speaking, cash and coin are only they're the only form of legal tender in the U.S. Everything else is not legal tender. It may be thought of as money, but it's not legal tender. And I'll just leave it at that and just kind of work from there. The Fed issues, like you said, reserves. It creates reserves out of thin air. You know what? Let me let me start with commercial banks because that's what we're familiar with. Banks create what's called bank money, what you call spending credit, what we call you know your bank account money out of thin air when they lend. So when you go into a bank, and you take out a $1,000 loan, the textbooks would sort of imply that the bank gets that money out of the vault. That is false. Instead, what the bank does, it just, it just uses its software and creates the $1,000 loan to credit your account out of thin air. And it is a liability on the bank's balance sheet. The asset corresponding to that $1,000 liability is the loan paper. It's the IOU from you to the bank. But the point is that the bank issues that that what we think of as money out of thin air, and it's a liability. The reason it's a liability is that once you have that $1,000 in your account, you can turn right around and ask for that money in cash, and the bank doesn't print cash. The Fed issues cash. The bank has to buy cash. And that's why the bank's got to be careful about how much money it creates out of thin air. But that's, that's, So that's one form of electronic money, and that's bank money. The other form of what people think of as electronic money at the Federal Reserve level is reserves. And reserves are just as just as bank money is a liability in the bank's balance sheet, reserves are a liability 
on the Fed's balance sheet. Um, and just as bank money is an, is an asset to you and me and other bank customers, reserves are an asset to account holders at the Federal Reserve. And for the most part, account holders at the Federal Reserve are commercial banks. There's a few other types. Uh, the US government is one, particularly the Treasury, to hold an account at the Fed, so are foreign central banks. But the dominant account holders at the Fed are commercial banks. So what you have there is a two-tiered system of reserves in one tier and bank money at, at another tier. And both of them are created by their respective institutions out of thin air. Now, when we talk about money printing and people talk about money printing in connection with the Fed ginning up reserves out of thin air, it really depends on what the Fed does with the reserves as to whether those reserves are going to have an impact in the real economy. Back in 2009 and 2010, when the, when the Fed was creating reserves out of thin air, it was buying assets from banks. I mean, let's face it, those banks were all bankrupt. We all know they were bankrupt. And the Fed was bailing them out. The Fed was printing up money out of thin air, and it was printing reserves out of thin air. And it was using those reserves to buy things like mortgage-backed securities from the banks. And the Fed was paying par value, or really more than par value, 103, 105 cents in the dollar for assets that you and I both know weren't worth anywhere near 100 cents in the dollar. And so from the bank's point of view, it was a great deal. You have a worthless asset, a mortgage-backed security that's riddled through with fraud. Maybe it's worth two cents in the dollar. In rides the Fed. The Fed prints up reserves out of thin air, pays the bank 100 cents for an asset, asset worth two cents. The banks are really happy. It was a bailout. That is not what happened in 2020. Yes, the Fed embarked on another quantitative easing campaign. Yes, the Fed ginned up reserves again out of thin air. But no, the Fed did not use those new reserves to buy assets from banks. And that's a crucial distinction. Because what the Fed did in 2020 was it ginned up about $4.5 trillion out of thin air in reserves. And it used those reserves to buy assets from non-banks. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference. And the reason it's a big difference is that non-banks that it was buying assets from, they don't have accounts at the Fed and they can't use reserves. I mean, it's like, you know, they can't use reserves any more than they can use Chuck E. Cheese tokens. You know, non-banks like you and me, we need, we need bank money. We need electronic spending credit, okay? So how does that work? How does the Fed use reserves to buy assets from a non-bank? Well, the answer is, I'm going to use an example. Let's use an example of CalPERS, the California Retirement Plan, the pension pensioners in California. Let's say CalPERS has a $1 billion mortgage-backed security on its balance sheet. It wants to offload that, that mortgage-backed security because it's not give, giving any yield. Uh, it's a low-yielding asset. In rides the Fed. The Fed prints up $1 billion of reserves. And it tries to give those reserves to CalPERS. And CalPERS is like, hey, you know, man, we can't use those reserves. So how does the transaction get pulled off? Well, here you go. It works this way. The Fed doesn't go to CalPERS. The Fed takes the, takes the mortgage-backed security from CalPERS, yes, and it puts it on its balance sheet as an asset. But the liabilities, the reserves, don't go to CalPERS. They go to CalPERS Bank. So let's say CalPERS is using J.P. Morgan Chase as its bank. The, the Fed would take the $1 billion in reserves. It would say, hey, J.P. Morgan, we're going to give you a $1 billion in reserves. You now have an extra $1 billion of assets on your balance sheet. You are to do the following thing. To balance out the $1 billion of new assets you have in your balance sheet, we instruct you to create out of thin air $1 billion of liabilities on your on the liability side of your balance sheet, and the name CalPERS will appear next to those liabilities. So in other words, CalPERS just had $1 billion of bank money infused into its account. It may, it may be a new account for a $1 billion, or maybe a pre-existing account that CalPERS has with JP Morgan has now been funded by a billion dollars uh, pursuant to the loan agreement, or pursuant to the asset sale just pulled off by the Fed and CalPERS. And so that is what happened with quantitative easing during the pandemic. So when the Fed, if you look at what happened and you take a step back, yes, the Fed created $4.5 trillion in reserves. However, due to the nature of the three-party transaction, that $4.5 trillion in new reserves also caused to be created at the same time $1 
in order to make the transaction balance out $4.5 trillion in bank money or bank spending credit, as you called it. And so that is why QE during the pandemic led to inflation, because when we went into the pandemic, the total amount of bank money in the United States, the total amount on deposit in commercial banks was sitting at 13 and a half trillion. Once the Fed was done with pandemic QE, you had now had bank money got rocketed up to 18 trillion. And that's where you that's where the, the inflation comes from. And I'm not alone in saying this. Recently, uh, Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, came out in 2022 during the summer and he said, yeah, that's that's where inflation came from. The Fed created money out of thin air and went into the ordinary money supply. And that didn't happen during the global financial crisis. That's why people think, oh, no, you create reserves and everything's safe because look at the global financial crisis. The Fed created one or two trillion dollars in reserves. There was no inflation. It was in deflationary. Yeah, well, there's a big difference because in the, in the global financial crisis, QE was the bailout of the banks and there was no retail involvement. There was no involvement of non-bank entities in any of those transactions. Those transactions back in the global financial crisis were simple asset swaps. They just swapped reserves for mortgage-backed securities or for treasury, and that was that. So there's a big difference in that. That difference is not widely understood. I've done video after video after video on it until finally in June of 2022, the Federal Reserve came out and said, yeah, that's how it works when we have a non-bank it gets into the retail money supply. That's fascinating. Um, I, I have two things I wanted to um, point out. I mean, I, I didn't even think about the fact that CalPERS would have been as part of the, the tri-party repo system. Um, I I'm not saying of, it was a repo. I'm saying that's just how QE well, works with a non That's well, I think that's what they use to move that the assets around, like to, you know, move, move For the sure. cash. Right. So, um, but I, I, I think I'm guessing BlackRock was probably the, the biggest intermediary to transmit um, reserves into bank spending credit. Does that, does that sound right? Well, <laughs> BlackRock was a big player in there. And we know about BlackRock. Let me take a step back. We don't really know who the, the counterparties were, who the really seller of the assets were. Because if you, the Fed releases that data, I think after the New York Fed, which is the, the Federal Reserve District that conducts all these QE transactions, they release that data after two years. But if you look at the data, they just give you the names of their primary dealers. They don't tell you the real buyer in interest. The reason we know BlackRock was involved is that BlackRock was brought on board by the Federal Reserve and was picked by the Fed to choose which assets the Fed was going to buy with the newly created reserves, including, by the way, assets sold by BlackRock itself. So think about that. Black, they bring BlackRock on. They're like, come on, you know, you be an agent of us. You'll help us pick which assets to buy and you can buy your own assets. So BlackRock's on both sides of the transaction. And BlackRock got the Fed to sign a waiver to say, yeah, no problem with that mm -hmm. at all. BlackRock being on both sides of the trade. So we know BlackRock was involved. And we know other big players had to have been involved because these transactions were massive. I mean, $4.5 trillion. I mean, the GDP is $20 trillion, right? So you yeah. just had you know, over 25% of GDP printed up out of thin air by the Fed and injected into bank accounts. So there had to be major non-bank players involved. So it would have been all the usual suspects. BlackRock, it would have been Apollo, you know, Vanguard. Fidelity, Warren Buffett, all, all the all the usual suspects had to have been involved in those transactions. Yeah, you know, in terms of a real world example that kind of illustrates the difference between the QE that occurred after the great financial crisis and the QE that, or the, really the money printing that occurred starting in March 2020 is if you look at housing market data, the housing market didn't really fully recover in terms of uh, transaction volume and prices from from the ta from the tanking, the beating it took in 2008 through 2010 until 2015. Yeah, so, you, you exactly. And then, you know, and in contrast to that, I mean, 
the housing market, as soon as the Fed started printing money in March 2020, I mean, the housing market took off like a bat out of hell. Yeah, so did the stock market. Well, the stock market did too. And the stock market actually took off in, you know, it, it had kind of a V bounce in yeah, starting in like stepped. April 2009, yep. but not not anywhere near as steep as what we saw after March 2020. Yeah, another big difference you saw is if you look at checkable deposits of people's personal accounts, the Fed divides society basically into tiers, the top 1%, the top you know 9% after that, and then from 50 to 90 percentile, and then from zero to the 50 percentile. If you look at all four of those you know bands of wealth, what you see is after the great financial crisis or the global financial crisis, everybody's wealth, their checkable deposits are declining. Everybody's losing money. But the exact opposite happens in the wake of the pandemic. Everybody's checkable deposits go way up. I did a video on that too and said, hey, you know, the top 1% of people, their average, their average checking, the average household in the top 1% saw its checking accounts go up by 800 plus thousand dollars, almost, almost wow. $900,000. Yeah, that did not happen in the, in the wake of the global financial crisis. That's, that's just, that's mind blowing. Yeah, and now, by the way, since I released that video, the Fed has come out and even subdivided further the wealth bands from four into five, and now they have data on the top 0.1%. You should take a look at those numbers. They'll, they'll blow your mind. Do you have to go to the um, the General Federal Reserve website, or can you get it on the um, St. Louis FRED database? The, the latter, the Fred uh, Federal Reserve Economic okay. Database. Yeah, because I've been curious about that. I, I'm, I'm yeah, actually... Just go on there and type in top 0.1% okay. and be amazed. You'll see the data. I'm sure. I'm sure. So uh, another um, another thing that was brought up on, on the um, podcast with, with Greg Hunter, and again, an excellent podcast, um, but I have always been contending that just raising the fed funds rate alone isn't really going to attack inflation yeah you might you might tamp down demand consumer demand to, to some extent so that yeah you know consumers might stop upgrading their computers and their TVs every two years or or with higher interest rates um or take less vacations or whatever but you, you still have to buy necessities and my thinking has always been, it, you know, if they want to really unwind inflation or get rid of inflation, they got to they got to take their balance sheet back down by a significant chunk. But right. um, you were actually talking about how hiking interest rates um, really tamps down loan demand and especially consumer loan demand. Well, and, in theory, it does. Right. So in, in which case that 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 would be um, that would be one way to attack consumer demand although it's still not going to uh, you know uh, it's it's still not going to do anything about um price inflation that we're seeing with necessities right right so one of the things i track i look at it every week is i, I really two things i always track if, every friday because the data comes out thursday and friday one is bank deposits okay and bank deposits the fed started raising interest rates in what july of last year i think it was actually sometime i think march was the first one Okay, even even better. So the Fed starts raising interest rates, say in March, say in the second quarter, whatever it was. I keep looking like, okay, when are bank deposits going to begin to sink? And they don't. They keep going up, 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 up. Finally, they start coming down. The other component of that, a big, the biggest component of bank deposits, because banks create money out of thin air when they lend, they, the biggest component of bank deposits uh, is, is lending, is loans. So the one thing I also look at on Fridays is loans and leases. So right now, bank deposits are sitting at about nah, 17.8 trillion. Loans and leases, meaning loans, is sitting at roughly $11 trillion. The rest of it is QE. But I kept looking like, okay, well, the Fed keeps raising interest rates. So even, even though bank deposits are going down because the Fed is offloading things from its balance sheet, um, it's sort of reversing QE, What's going on with loans and leases? Surely by raising interest rates, people are going to stop taking out loans, right? No, not right. Um, and loans just kept, you know, despite increase after increase after increase, 
in the lending rate and the interest rate, loans and leases kept going up. And it wasn't until two weeks ago that finally loans and leases started to tick down. It was just like the Fed must be pulling its hair out, trying to get the money supply, trying to get the inflation genie back in the bottle and sitting there raising interest rates. And yet they're watching consumers go out and take more and more loans. Finally, consumers are taking less loans now. But man, did it take some time for that to for that to, to bake into the cake? Well, amazing. that loan, the loans and leases metric, that also includes corporate loans, right? I think, yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, I can I can see, and I think it's been um, written about that corporations um, have been taking out a lot less, a lot, you know, a lot less loans since the Fed started hiking interest rates. But what's interesting, and this is why I'm saying you're not you're not going to attack inflation with just interest rate hikes is that consumer debt as you as you mentioned has been hitting new records every month for the last yeah. several months even with higher rates so the latest the latest numbers from the fed and it's got a two month lag on it showed that uh revolving credit which is mostly credit card debt again hit a new record high in november and yeah and um I mean, what to me, what's frightening about this is that uh, the Census Bureau did a survey in December, and one of the things that it found out was that 35% of all consumers or households had to use credit card debt to make ends meet. So we're talking That's about horrifying. it just horrifying. We're talking about putting food on the table, paying their electric bill. Um, I assume they're probably <laughs> playing, you know, hide the salami with with uh, with their debt by taking out a credit card loan to pay off auto debt because yeah. auto auto delinquencies have started to rise quite a bit. In fact, we're almost yeah. we're almost up to the level where we were in 2008 or 2009. I was writing about it in my late my latest short sellers journal. Um, so, uh, you know, Households are, are you know, a, a, a large percentage of households, larger than you would think, are, are really, uh, you know, at the tipping point financially. Yeah, they're in a tight spot. And the Fed's, really, the economy is in a tight spot, too. If you look back historically at the, at the sort of what I'll call the consumer money supply, what you call the retail, you know, bank spending credits, when that begins to tick down, uh, it's it's a sign of trouble. So back in the global financial crisis, I think it was a four month period between say March and July. You know, whenever whenever you have a debt based economy that's sort of addicted to more and more credit and ever expanding credit, and that credit begins to flatten or even contract, you know, you're 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 risking and you're flirting with a deflationary spiral like the kind that happened in two thousand and eight, and so. With, you know, we're seeing bank deposits contract now, and you're also seeing loans contract, even though people are in a, in a tight spot, like you're saying, that's a double whammy, you know, so the Fed risks having a problem here of having a sort of a deflationary spiral on the one hand, but having sort of latent in, inflation already baked into the cake from over a year ago it was in the PPI. It's still transmitting through the system. I mean, this is this is a recipe for a big time problem this year. Well, and, and what I would argue is that the, you know, the bulk of the deflationary spiral that you're talking about is really going to show up in asset prices. Everything that has been inflated by the Fed reserve creation, a.k.a. money printing. So the stock market, which, you know, actually started rolling over. And I think that part of that was fundamentals based in in November for the NASDAQ last November and the beginning of January for the S&P and the Dow. And now housing prices are starting to tank and it's tank housing, quickly, yeah. as are used car prices. And what's yep. interesting about that, I mean, think think about, you know, think about what's going to happen to the value of, of that collateral when it's, you know, when you use your house or some people use even their cars as collateral for loans. Great point. How many people, how many people borrowed against their home to buy crypto? You know, there you go. <laughs> I mean, there are any number of nightmare scenarios you can spin out here, and they all spell big time trouble. That's right. Well, and then you know, there's some banks that have been using you know loans 
loans against crypto as as collateral oh. and silver <laughs> silvergate is one right um right so in one other topic that um you had discussed and i just kind of wanted to flush it out a little bit more um was that you were looking for a, a fed pivot sometime this year i think i think you might have mentioned september no one's going to hold you to september yeah i was kind of thinking well first of all when i think of a fed pivot i'm not i'm not thinking about oh well the fed's going to start lowering interest rates you know for me that's what a pivot is that the, you know the the fed let's say the fed takes fed funds rate up to five and a quarter and holds it there for how you know some time let's just call yeah, okay. it some time yeah. you know for me the pivot would be when they start lowering interest rates and and stop quantitative tightening and revert back to quantitative easing yeah i i think both of those are going to happen i think You'll see a reversal in the, in the interest rate. You'll you'll start seeing interest rate decreases. I don't think the Fed has any choice in that. I mean, Jerome Powell is on record as saying, yes, the United States is on a fiscally unsustainable path. And one of the main reasons is on that path is that if you look at the, the big sort of non-negotiable payments on the budget, meaning interest on the debt, plus Medicare, plus Medicaid, plus Social Security, they're basically eclipsing tax revenue, and that's just unsustainable because your bar means you're borrowing money to pay essentially an interest payment. Um, and so the, the notion that we're going to—I mean, the interest on the debt alone, yeah, it's it's it doesn't affect all the the backdated debt, right? So thirty-year Treasury you bought a while ago isn't affected by interest rate increases, but eventually you're going to roll over that debt, and a lot of debt is new anyway. So those interest payments are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger if the Fed keeps raising rates. And the, and the U.S. is already in a tight spot in terms of how much money it's spending, you know, on those programs that it can't really, it can't really reduce. So I, to me, the, the interest rate increases, um, there there's going to be a short-term solution because eventually the U.S. is going to be put in a position, and it is in the position now, of a lot of sovereign countries that are, they have intractable debt, meaning their debt is running away from their GDP, which is unsustainable. And Jerome Powell will tell you that's unsustainable. And when that happens, historically, countries resort to try to try trying to inflate their way out of that problem by basically, you know, paying off, you know, more relatively more valuable debt with relatively less valuable currency. And the U.S. will undoubtedly embark on that gambit. Uh, sooner or later, and I'm thinking there's no way this game is going to go on through the rest of this year. I mean, for for crying out loud, look what happened when the Fed tried to reduce the balance sheet back the first go round. You saw the balance sheet contracting from you know basically January of 2018 up through September of 2019. What happened? Systems addicted to debt. You have a repo crisis. Yeah. Then you have another round of QE, a bigger round of QE, a lot bigger. You know, I think the same that same cycle we're we're in a cycle now we're in a cycle of oh you know everything's okay we'll get back to normal we'll trim the balance sheet whoa whoa the patient's gone into shock the patient suffered withdrawal the debt-based monetary system needs a massive amount of fresh credit you know fed you got to come to the rescue that rescue's coming that's that third round third massive round of qe it's gonna happen sooner or later get guaranteed all right, John. That's that's very interesting. I mean, if if you're correct, and and the Fed, you know, we'll just refer to a pivot as meaning stops hiking interest rates. And as you were explaining, there's a good possibility that they'll have to start taking interest rates back down and and probably printing more money. Because I've yeah. I've always been of the opinion that they can't now that they've let that genie out of the bottle. Really, starting in two thousand eight they're going to have to keep printing more and more money, you know, kind of at a geometric rate, unless yeah. they don't care if the system completely collapses. Yeah. That bailout decision is irreversible. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, quite frankly, you know, the price of gold is already up 48% since March, 2020 when it bottomed. Wow. Um, imagine what's going to happen to the precious metal sector once it gets a whiff that the Fed is going to blink and and pull out of its game of chicken with with the economy and the markets, I mean, 
the, the precious metals will take off like like a bat out of hell yeah that's likely i think the bigger factor i mean to really be blunt is all of this is going on against the backdrop of a system that's frankly criminal it has not had the rule of law mm -hmm. for over 10 years and more and more people know about it and trust is hard to come by and once trust is hard to come by and you don't trust your counterparties people are going to do exactly what people who have been doing in the precious metals segment for thousands of years which is they bypass the counterparties and they hold them they hold money that doesn't require a counterpart counterparty like asset or assets that don't require a counterparty like gold and silver and i think that's a that's going to be a big factor as you see more and more open criminality like ftx you know ftx is a situation it's way worse than than uh mf global it's way worse even than bernie madoff those people there the, the worse than enron those, it, but those creditors were remunerated ftx everybody's gonna be wiped out in toto and it's a it's a massive fraud and there's more and more of that fraud in the system and it's becoming more and more apparent to more people and so when you have a system where you really don't have the rule of law you know one of the best passages you ever read about gold for my money was written by ian fleming and goldfinger you know through the character colonel smithers and he says you know gold is a talisman of fear and fear is what you get when you don't have any trust and you see the criminality coming from the top well and it's i mean it's it's gonna it's gonna be twofold because the value of the dollar is gonna collapse and and you know concomitantly the price of gold and silver especially priced in dollars is going to you know do a moonshot probably even go yeah, the dollar the dollar could take a while simply because something like 60 percent of the world's debt is denominated in dollars that could be a slow death well i mean it's already lost 98 percent of its value since 2013 versus gold right <laughs> and yeah most... but not against other currencies that, that's, that's true the, that's um that, that's true but i i think we're i think we're witnessing the death of all fiat currencies right now and you're right it's 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 you know i think as investors in the precious metal sector we tend to be very impatient for for it to happen more quickly but um i mean as you're probably well aware probably more than i am um it takes a long time for for um currencies to really lose all of their value yeah i mean it, it took a long time to pass the torch uh from the pound sterling to the u.s dollar yeah uh, you, you know how long did that take you know 30 some odd years yep I mean, this could take a while especially when you know the second if you look at like the dominant currencies it's yes it's the dollar at 60 60 sitting at 60 percent of all debt the next currency down i think is the is the is the euro i think that's right. it's way down the next the, 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 and then the japanese yen after that these are just ants compared to the dollar elephant yeah that's that's true and that's that quite frankly that's probably the only factor that's that's saved the dollar at this point it, you know, it's a and big as, factor yeah as more and more people realize that well that plus the u.s military but as more and more people realize that i think that's really when we're going to see the price of gold and silver take off it could be you, you could be exactly right about that i mean again it goes you know it goes back to the fear factor to me but i i think you're right i think the brighter days are ahead for precious metals yeah well john you've been really generous with your time especially after my uh my my little issue earlier <laughs> trying to use the zoom technology and i i really appreciate it and yeah. i'd love to have you on my bi-weekly podcast again sometime soon because as we when we were discussing you know what we chat about on this we flushed out another topic that i think would have extreme interest especially to precious metal sector investors so i'd love to have you back on for that can you how about, um, how about a special episode where we replay all the golden truth episodes that we recorded back in 2014 and 15. <laughs> that would look like black and white television compared to what we're doing right now <laughs> those, those were good times man that was that was fun they were good times it was fun yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um can you you know tell the audience where they can find all your material 
Yeah, really, um, it, it, YouTube is a good start, best evidence. You can search my name, John Titus, T-I-T-U-S, find it that way. I'm also on Odyssey and BitChute. I also happen to think while we're doing this, I have a sub stack, although I haven't been active on it for a while, but YouTube is a good start. And really, I don't do a lot of videos. I wait until I feel like I've got something to say that nobody else is saying, and sometimes that takes a while. Oh, understood. I completely understand that. So, and we'll have a, I'll make sure Chris puts a link to your best evidence YouTube channel in, in the, in the YouTube. Uh, yeah. In the description. Box. Yeah. This. Greatly yeah, appreciated. The, exactly. So, well, thanks again for coming on and uh, Arcadia Economics audience. I'll see you all in two weeks. Thanks Dave. Well, thank you to both John and Dave for the fantastic conversation and breaking down some of the mechanics of what's going on with the Fed and some of these quantitative easing programs. Hopefully that helped put things in a little better perspective. Obviously, John has an amazing ability to break these things down and explain how they are working and why we are headed to another round of quantitative easing coming up in the future. We'll see exactly when that does begin, but... Again, as mentioned, you can find more from John Titus at his Best Evidence YouTube channel. Link to that is in the description field below. And also, as Dave mentioned, today's episode brought to you by Silver Viper Minerals. We actually did have some news out from Silver Viper this morning as they presented the results from their geophysical and geochemical surveys at La Virginia, where the geophysical survey has identified new targets at El Molino, and the geological mapping and rock and chip sampling have outlined new targets at Los Cantiles, El Oriental, and the eastern and southern sections of Macho Libre at Los Cantiles. The surface chip channel samples results came up to 5.7 grams per ton gold, 148 grams per ton silver, dump samples of up to 17.8 grams per ton gold and 1,001 grams per ton silver and chip samples of up to 4.2 grams per ton gold and 310 grams per ton silver have been located at El Oriental and hydrothermal silicified breccia with up to 2.36 grams per ton gold and 71 grams per ton silver have been outlined at Macho Libre. Actually going to be catching up with Steve Cope of Silver Viper a little later this afternoon. So We'll look forward to hearing his thoughts on some of these new results, which will be on the channel shortly. And congratulations to Silver Viper on the results. In addition to their deal with Canisil Resources that Dave mentioned earlier today in the show. So going to wrap up for today, but thanks again for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the conversation with John and Dave. And again, stay tuned as I will have an update from Steve Cope of Silver Viper going over his results a little bit later today.